Good morning. It is July 11th. It's 8.45 in the morning and I'm going to do the video on Manifest Destiny today. Uh, try to catch you up with uh, the videos we lost while my computer, my webcam, and my microphone weren't working correctly. Alright, so I'll keep this pretty short and to the point for you guys. Uh, Manifest Destiny. This idea was the, all the rage in the 1840s and the idea of manifest destiny if I were to simplify it for you down into like one sentence God said go west there was this belief in the 1840s that a higher power God so to speak had placed Americans on the continent of North America with the idea and with the goal of spreading civilization spreading Western ideas from coast to coast and these ideals are going to be spread whether the people living here already wanted it to or not. And it becomes a huge political issue that we have multiple presidents who are going to run for office based on the idea of manifest destiny. And it's going to be used to go to war with Mexico. It's going to be used for, against Native Americans. And just this idea of spreading civilization and democracy, it's this drive to do this whether people want it or not a lot of american settlers are going to go to california a lot of them are going to go to the pacific northwest uh, some difficulties with both of those locations though uh, the oregon territory which today is like washington state oregon uh, idaho that area that was owned by Britain at the time, and there was a little bit of a dicey situation between Britain and the United States. The way that most of those people got to the Pacific Northwest was with the Oregon Trail, and there's a very famous game based on the Oregon Trail. I don't know if you've played it or not. If you haven't, it's available for free on the internet. You should give it a try. But this was a trail that was like 2,000 miles long that went from Independence, Missouri to the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which today is a huge apple producing area of the country. We have somewhere around 80,000 people who just pick up everything and put them on wagons and head out to the Pacific Northwest. And in many ways, it's a race between the British government and the American government to find out and figure out how many people they can get there. Because basically the treaty said whoever gets the most people will be the ones who uh, get control of the territory. Uh, from that, uh, we've got the California Trail. Uh, the California Trail is going to be very important starting in 1848 and 1849 because of gold being discovered in California. It's a trail that started in Independence, Missouri and went to where the gold was in California. And the gold is going to bring more than a quarter million people to California very quickly. Uh, the last trail that's on this screen right here is called the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, it was more of a trading route and a route to drive cattle to market. So you've got a trail that went from Santa Fe, Mexico, today, New Mexico, to St. Louis. That was the primary trading route between Mexico and the United States. And that was also how ranchers got their cattle to the railroads to sell the market. The one place they're not going is known as the Great American Desert, and that's really the Great Plains. You got Nebraska, North and South Dakota, uh, you got Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, all those places are going to be where people don't move. And it's quite simply because um, not a lot of trees. There's nothing there. It doesn't rain very much. I, I know if you watch the weather, it looks like it rains there all the time because that's where the bad weather usually is. It's where tornadoes are known. But other than the rainy season, it's very dry. Now, because that is where Americans didn't think you could live because of the flat ground, the lack of trees, the lack of water, that's going to be where Native Americans are moved to. You may have also seen videos on the Old West, maybe an old cowboy movie or something like that. And you see 
damsels in distress, you see saloons, you see people drinking all the time, shootouts with Indians and cowboys. That's not actually how it happened. Uh, you were very unlikely to encounter Native Americans. They mostly kept to themselves. Uh, wagon trains travel, and if they do encounter a Native American, that person's probably going to give them some food and water. Uh, so what makes the Old West so bad then? Uh, it's really disease and death. Uh, this is a time period before modern medicine, so if you get hurt or injured, Every injury is potentially fatal. Uh, there's not a lot of food because you can only bring so much with you. And there are over 20,000 deaths per year of people moving out west. The most famous example of people who fail at moving west is the Donner Party. Uh, you may or may not have heard of them. I don't know. Uh, but George Donner is a wealthy farmer from southern Illinois. Uh, just outside of the St. Louis area, if I remember correctly. And his group decides to move to, um, to the West Coast. They leave too late. They don't pack the right stuff. They get lost. They fall victim to a scandal. Somebody lies to them. They're already having trouble and more people join their party because you know, they, they have a, I don't know, how do I want to say it? They, word of them spreads and being a prominent farmer, you know, everybody wants to join the Donner Party. Well, they decide to change directions halfway through the trip and go to California instead of, of Oregon. And then they get lost, a freak storm hits, and then they get stuck for weeks in they don't have enough food, so they start to eat each other. Of the 120-something people who were at the Donner Party at its largest, at its peak, only 40-something make it to California. It's a complete and total disaster. So the Donner Party, more than anything else, represents how wrong things can go moving out west. Now, you can't talk about moving out west without talking about Texas. American settlers are going to be moving into Texas as early as the 1820s. Uh, Mexico gets its independence from Spain shortly after the defeat of Napoleon. And the area today known as Texas was originally part of Mexico, and the Mexican government wants to invite people in to grow its population. So the Mexican government is going to invite Southerners from the United States into Texas with a couple of, of rules. Number one, no slaves. Mexico is a slave-free country. So the Southern Americans say uh, they're not slaves, they're indentured servants. All right, good enough for us. Then the Mexican government says, uh, we need you to convert to Catholicism. The American settlers say, okay, we can do that. But they don't actually. They just kind of pretend. And then last but not least, the Mex Mexican government says, all right, you're going to be living in a foreign country. Uh, we don't mind if you import stuff from the United States, but you have to pay a tax on it. And the American settlers lose their you-know-what over that. So by 1835, um, the... American settlers living in Texas and the Mexican government who runs Texas, they don't like each other very much. So on March 6th, 1836, the attack on the Alamo happens, and it doesn't quite happen the way that people from Texas like to say. Uh, the Alamo was originally a Spanish church known as a mission, and it had become the seat of power, basically the capital of the Mexican territory of Texas. The American settlers are going to take it over, throw out the Mexican government, and the Mexican government is going to gather an army and come and take it back by force. Of the 250 American settlers who were holed up and defending the Alamo, uh, 
200 of them or so die, including Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and Jim Bowie of the Bowie Knife fame. After this, um, independence is going to be declared. A guy named Sam Houston is going to be declared the, the leader of Texas. He's going to de declare independence from Mexico. And the Mexican-Texan War for Independence lasts so about two months or so. The dictator of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, is forced to sign a peace treaty, but the difficulty is the Mexican government didn't recognize the dictator's uh, ability to sign the treaty, and so the treaty wasn't really recognized. And so even though Texas is technically independent, it is still going to suffer some attacks from the Mexican government for a couple of more months. Now, Texas never really wanted to become an independent country. Its goal the entire time was to become part of the United States, but the United States, they didn't want to go to war with Mexico, and they knew that if they joined with Texas, a war was going to happen. So for over 10 years, Texas does remain an independent country. Finally, in 1845, the bright conditions happen in Washington, D.C., and Congress votes to annex Texas into the country. Trying to avoid a war, uh, President James Polk is going to send a negotiator to Mexico City and try to figure out a deal, but Mexico City was in the process of having another civil war, and things just didn't work out. Finally, when the United States gets a negotiator to Mexico, there's a dispute over where the boundary should be. And that boundary dispute does not get solved. And so James K. Polk says, you know what? This land was part of the, the Louisiana Purchase anyway, so we were just trying to be nice and negotiate, but really it's ours, so we're going to take it. And that is going to set off what's known today as the Mexican-American War. Uh, that war lasts about two years, and to put it quite simply, it does not go well for Mexico. Um, Mexico loses every battle. Mexico's biggest cities are going to be invaded, and the U.S. Marines basically show up at the capital of Mexico City and knock on the, the front steps on the door. The resulting Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is going to settle the Mexican-American War, and it gives the United States all or parts of California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, firm control over Texas. Now, one last thing to talk about, immigration. Immigration is going to be a big deal throughout American history. We like to think that immigration is a modern-day problem or a modern-day issue, but it's absolutely not. Now, I will say, during the wars of Napoleon, there's almost no immigration to the United States, and that's just because transatlantic travel is kind of stopped. But once Napoleon is defeated in 1815, people start coming to the United States very quickly. These numbers here are per year numbers. So around 1825, you get 11,000 immigrants per year, but by 1840, you're getting 84,000 immigrants per year. And those numbers just keep going up and up and up. Uh, New York City is going to be the place where most of these immigrants go, but it's not like today where you know there's Ellis Island and they go and get processed and then come in. No, it was uh, up until 1855, you, your boat just showed up on a dock in New York City and you went wherever. 1855, the first immigration office at uh, Castle Garden is opened and all they would do is, uh, what's your name, where are you from, uh, what's your date of birth, and are you healthy? The two biggest groups of immigrants are the Irish and the Germans. Uh, the Irish really start coming over here in 1848 and later, and that's because of the potato famine. Most of the Irish are poor, so they don't really have money to move out of the cities they land in. And that is why today New York City and Philadelphia and uh, Boston have such large Irish descent populations. It's because that's where the Irish came and they didn't have money to go anywhere else, so they just kind of stayed. 
Uh, the other big group is going to be Germans, and that is also going to be after 1848, but their reason for coming is a little different. In European history, the year 1848 is significant because there are a lot of, of uh, revolutions based on Enlightenment ideals, basically equality and freedom, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Germany at the time didn't exist. It was a series of a couple dozen independent kingdoms. And in 1848, as part of this Enlightenment movement, Germans wanted to unite and serve under a king. Well, the person that they chose to be their king kind of said, uh, no, I, d I don't want to be your king. And that meant that uh, the revolution in Germany failed. So if you're on the wrong side of that revolution, uh, you have two choices. You can stay and be killed by your, your ruler you were trying to replace, or you can go elsewhere. And many Germans decided to come to America after that failed revolution. Now, the Germans, by and large, were middle and upper class people. They were well educated and they had money. And when they came over to the United States, they were able to move further west and find places that reminded them of home. And that is why you find a lot of Germans in the Midwest or in the upper Midwest. They're not the only groups, though. You do still have British coming over. Uh, they're coming over mainly to work in factories and in textile mills as the United States become industrialized. You get a lot of Scandinavians moving into Minnesota, Wisconsin, and northern Illinois. And um, just give you an idea, in the city of Rockford, Illinois, uh, that's where my family is from, they have a Scandinavian, specifically a Swedish hospital system, a Swedish school system. People do speak Swedish up there still. Um, they even have restaurants devoted to Swedish food that are not IKEA. So um, a lot of Scandinavians. And then finally, you have Chinese coming to the West Coast, and they were primarily used to mine for gold and to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. This does bring a lot of xenophobia. Uh, xenophobia is basically the fear of outsiders. And you have a lot of Catholics that come in here who are going to cause fear amongst the Protestants. There was actually the belief that the Pope was going to come and take over the United States. There's a political party that's founded on the idea of anti-immigration and anti-Catholicism. They were known as the Know Nothing Party. And the Know Nothing Party is going to become part of the Republican Party in 1856. And then this guy here, this is Karl Marx. If you don't know about him, he is the creator of Marxism, which becomes eventually the ideal of communism. And Marxist ideology scared the pants off of the people who believed in capitalism. Um, there were some ideas that turned out not to be true about how Marxists were going to burn down the country and all these other things. Um, a lot of people in the early to mid 17th era, I should say, early to mid 1800s, were were afraid of Marxism, and they were afraid of organized labor. But what organized labor was going for was better pay, better working hours, better conditions of work, uh, unions, vacation times, things like that. So um, this is going to end up becoming a turning point in the country as far as Marxism, xenophobia, um, treatment of outsiders that isn't resolved until after the Civil War. All right, 20 minutes here. I hope it's short enough that you listen to it. If you have any questions about anything that's in this video, just send me an email. I don't mind helping you guys out or making this make more sense to you. But I just wanted to get something out there so that you have an idea of what these slides mean. All right, we'll talk to you soon, and uh, have a great day. Bye.